Hello and welcome to Northeast Fiber Folk. This is season one, episode one, and today my guest is Siri, one half of Yankee Rock Farm. So um, I've invited Siri over to talk to us about um, her life as a shepherdess and a shearer and kind of tell us her backstory. So welcome Siri. Thanks. Yeah, we're uh, we're super excited to be here for the first episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you want to just start, kind of maybe tell us, how did you get into sheep? Yeah, so we got started, uh, my partner and I both, before we were together, um, in sheep through 4-H. So we did 4-H projects as kids. I actually got started with chickens <laughs> um, and he was doing rabbits. And then both of us separately as little kids in 4-H, um, our clubs took a shift towards sheep just for something new and we never looked back. So I, uh, I've had sheep since I was a kid, even though I didn't grow up in a farm family. And then I ended up going to college for animal science and here I am still doing it today. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what, what sheep did you start with? I got started in 4-H because I was in a club with a bunch of other kids, um, basically with a bunch of different breeds. <laughs> so my very first sheep that I showed was a uh, Romney, um, but I also worked with South Downs. I had some Caracals for a while. Uh, the first sheep I bought was a Tunis Border Lester Cross. Um, and then I eventually settled on fins. So I think two years in with my own sheep, um, I bought a few fins and that's the breed that I've been raising since. Yeah. So kind of maybe tell us where are you at now with, um, with things and, and your business and yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So like I said, I've, I've had fins ever since. So, um, I have fins and my partner Colin had border lesters. So right now our farm, it's in Orwell, Vermont. Um, and our main focus on the farm is raising purebred registered fins and border lesters. Um, we also sell yarn, raw fleeces, roving. We sell some meat locally. We kind of do it all, but our primary Thing, the, the, what we're really working on is raising um, registered animals. Yeah. So border lusters and fin. Why? Why those two? Yeah, we um, we came to them in 4-H and just never got rid of them. But like I was saying, I tried a bunch of other breeds, and so did Colin. So we stuck with these two, really because we love raising maternal sheep. So when we talk about breeds of sheep. There's so many different ways to classify them, but my favorite is talking in terms of maternal or terminal. And then we also have our heritage breeds, which they can fit in multiple categories. But the maternal breeds are ones that are really known for maternal strengths. They're really good mothers. Um, those often are also wool breeds and technically fins and border lusters are wool breeds. But I think the maternal label really encompasses that. Um, all that they do a little bit better. So they're wool breed, they're maternal sheep, and we really love them because of their hardiness, their ability to raise lambs really well, they're pretty low maintenance, um, but they're also really well-rounded sheep. Yeah, yeah, I did, I've never heard of that um, mm. classifying. So. Yeah, yeah, it's different, like so with wool we often talk about grades of wool, um, and everyone knows about meat sheep or wool sheep, but I don't like calling meat breeds meat breeds because people think then that wool is no good. And if we talk about wool breeds, people often forget about the meat qualities. But any sheep can do both, except hair sheep, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that maternal terminal. It kind of fits in the industry at large a little better. I know that it, for us, it seems like everybody knows that, but like nobody knows that outside of yeah. sheep because you know I told somebody I have a dairy sheep and they're like oh they have ones just for dairy I'm like yep yeah. yeah and those ones still produce wool you know so yeah. the dairy sheep would still make perfectly good wool we'll see if she's maternal yeah you know anything about East Frisians yeah they're um, kind of all over the place because they've been bred so much for dairy mm -hmm. some of the other qualities haven't been focused on so much but I know some that do a good job with their lambs yeah so, um, as far as like a lot of my viewers are probably into spinning and knitting and so 
for them, what qualities do Finn and Border Lusters have that you can talk about? Yeah, so um, the Border Luster is a long wool breed. So when we talk about long wools, medium wools, fine wools, they're on the finer side of the long wool category. So they're really hardy, um, tough wearing wool. It's pretty durable, but it's not as itchy or coarse as say like a Lincoln or a Cotswold. They're a little bit softer than that. Um, so I actually, I have some yarn. This is our Border Luster DK. Couple different colors here. Um, and I think this is the softest long wool I've ever felt in a yarn. It's, it's really lustrous, so it's kind of got a silkiness to it. Um, and interestingly enough, so these are natural and that white is natural, this one's dyed. But our white yarn is a little bit softer than the colors. So even within a breed, there's some variation from fleece to fleece. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, not super lofty. It's a little more, it's got more of a drape to it, a little bit heavier than some of your medium and fine wools. This, this is that yarn crocheted. Mm -hmm. Did this Colin is, do this? This is Did Colin's it? crochet. Cool. Yeah. So let's just say who Colin is. So Colin is the other half of Yankee Rock Farm. Yep. He's your partner. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool that he crochets. I think that's so yeah. cool. So is this like a little shawl? Yep. Yeah. That's that so was sweet. the very first thing he made with our yarn when we got it got it made for the first time <laughs> <laughs> might need to be a little bit longer for me but yeah. it's cute oh my gosh yeah so that's cool so can i ask about colin and um when did he start crocheting yeah he got started with fiber arts um also when he got started with sheep in 4-h uh if you're not familiar with 4-h it's it's a program for kids that really encourages them to try a lot of different things and that's exactly what he did so he started off spinning um, then crochet and knitting and he just fell in love with crochet more than knitting, but he does um, he does it all I want to see him spin now like, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, I actually have a bunch of his old hand spun that I'm now weaving with because I got into that a little bit um, From like 10 years ago, and he's looking at it like oh my gosh my spinning was awful <laughs> It's like, it's okay, you were a little kid in 4-H, it's fine. <laughs> well, I mean, everybody's first spinning is exactly. awful. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, these, these are really lovely. I wish you guys could feel them. They're really soft, and they just have amazing drape, like she was saying. So we also did this sport weight yarn. Mm -hmm. So we have some more dyed colors for this one. But this is also Borlester. Um, and what's really interesting to me is it's definitely a little more itchy than the DK. Same exact wool, just spun differently, you know, to make it's, a sport weight. Yeah, yeah, if I could say, I, my guess would be it's just a higher twist. Mm -hmm. And that helps, that makes the prickle kind of stand out a little yeah. bit more. But I still think it feels really lovely. These are really beautiful. Yeah, so these dyed colors mm -hmm. are dyed over this natural gray. Yeah. We just didn't have a white made because we didn't have enough wool at the time. Right. So we're like... Mm -hmm try color yeah. over the gray yeah i mean it really adds a depth to the to the yeah. color yeah that a white wouldn't so it's really cool yeah yeah these are lovely and so if anybody's interested in in this mm -hmm. do you do you sell this online or locally or where yeah. can they find it we have it in a few local shops um but most of it's online uh my website's just yankee rock farm um, and we'll have anything that's in stock is always there. Mm -hmm. I'll link the website below for you. Cool. Um, so, and then I want to mention, I know that, so if anybody, you know, we're here in Vermont, um, you have some yarn at Muscle of Yarn? Yep, in Shelburne. Yeah. Yep. Anywhere else? People um, yeah, uh, Hermit Thrush Fiber Company, um, which is also here in Vermont, carries some of our Border Lester and some at Prado de Lana Farm in Massachusetts. Yeah. All right. So I don't, this isn't the only yarn. Since we're on yarn, do we want to show the other? Yeah. So that's all of our Border Lester. Thin wool is really unique. So this is the yarn that we have. We've done some dyed colors, but I'm out of stock now. Mm -hmm. um, so thin is supposed to be a medium wool, but looking at the character of the raw wool, they really almost sometimes look more like a long wool. And if you micron test them to actually get a real number value for what their wool grades, it's all over the place. There are some fins that I think are almost fine fleeced. Mm -hmm. There's definitely some solidly in the medium wools and there's some that probably would micron medium but look like a long wool. Mm -hmm. So fin fleeces are all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's not a ton of consistency. 
One thing that they almost always have in common is just a super soft handle. Mm -hmm. So even the ones that look like long wools, they're super, super soft mm -hmm. to the touch. Um, this is our fin knit into a cowl. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this is again Colin's crochet. Yeah, that's really cool. So <laughs> with fins. So cow. Who knit this? Um, Nell, uh, she's on, I think, Ravelry and Instagram is Nell Knits. Mm -hmm. And she designed a pattern for this cowl and then kind of reworked it to match our fin yarn mm. um, at a little heavier because that's a worsted weight. Yeah, so it's got like kind of almost a leaf to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see what the hat looks like. So this is Colin's crochet. Very nice. I love the cables. Yeah, he was super excited to try this. That's cool. Wow. So this one has a little more loft to it yeah. than um, the Borderlaster. There's a little more bounce, like in a medium wool. Mm -hmm. But uh, it also has a little more durability still compared to a lot of medium and fine wools. Yeah, so uh, to me, the the, um, the bounce on that, you can see it's really clear. It's um, a very like round. Mm -hmm. fluffy and it almost looks this almost looks like a cormo wood mm -hmm. the shape of it is yeah. very yeah it's super soft very beautiful thanks cool yeah did you have anything else you want to share with us yeah i think i've got um some roving so this kind of branches off into my other job <laughs> besides <laughs> farming um we also shear full time. So that's all our flocks wool that I was talking about. This roving is a little bit of Borderlaster, but also a bunch of breeds of sheep that we shear. So they're not from my flock, but they're animals that we work with. Um, I'll show you the Borderlaster first, because that's what we were just looking at. So this is a, a, a breed sampler for mm -hmm. those that want to try different breeds. You get a little box. Yep. And you get different samples of roving. Yeah. So, so this first one is... This is our border luster. That one is from our flock. Okay. Um, and you can see the luster in it. It's it's like people who haven't worked with wool very much sometimes look at it and think there's silk in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a lot of shine. Yeah. Um, and then I'll stick with the white wools to start. So here is traditionally a meat breed, but this is Shropshire. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a true medium wool. Okay. And that has a lot of, and if I'm not, um, just from my spinning knowledge, it has a lot of um, uh, bounce, and I think it can mm -hmm. be um, less likely to felt. Yeah. 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 So we call this, um, Shropshires are technically a terminal breed, mm -hmm. um, and they have black faces and black legs. Okay. So their wool, we can't sell on a commercial market as mm -hmm. white wool, because right. there could be little bits of black fiber right. in it. Yeah. Um, and but it, a lot of those breeds that have the black faces and black legs don't felt very well mm -hmm. which is nice for some knit items like socks yeah i hear this is you know, like the thing to try for socks mm -hmm. yeah and then tunis um have it's a little more soft but it's still a medium wool and tunis is a breed that has a red face and red legs so yeah. it's the same thing we can't sell it as white wool on the commercial market mm -hmm. um but it's a really beautiful fiber mm -hmm. yeah it's lovely soft too and then for natural colors oh this is my favorite this is columbia columbia's mm -hmm. are traditionally a white breed mm -hmm. but they've been bred more and more to come in natural colors okay um and it's a breed that was actually developed here in the states so when we talk about domestic wool and supporting local this is a breed that is really truly local to this um to the united states and mm -hmm. they they're medium to fine wool um, super, super soft, gorgeous mm -hmm. animals. I love sharing them. Yeah, that's really lovely. It's got some nice bounce to it, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I don't know that I've had Columbia. Yeah, because um, they're trying. mostly raised like out in the West and Midwest on big range flocks. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the wool goes into the commercial market. It doesn't usually hit hand spinners, but we bought some when we were out shearing and got it processed. And then this is Baby Doll South Down. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty different from regular South Downs. Baby dolls are actually developed in like the 90s, 80s here in the States mm -hmm. to look like the old fashioned South Downs. Mm -hmm. But South Downs usually come in white. Baby dolls come in a variety of colors. Mm -hmm. So that's white and colored wool all processed together. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of different fleeces, actually from a 
flock here in Vermont that's just retired old baby dolls. They don't breed them anymore. They just hang out. But that's got such a nice bounce to it. Mm -hmm. That is so fun. And they're adorable little. They're very cute. cute. They look like little like teddy bears. (laughs) Yeah, I might see if I can pull a picture from online somewhere. And then lastly is Jacob. So this one. Um, it's another breed that like micron and grade is all over the place. Yeah. So I think that feels a little bit coarser than the others. Yeah. Um, and they're sheep that are naturally white and black. They have spots on them. So again, that's like white wool and colored wool mixed together. So you never quite know what color it'll come out to mm-hmm. as roving, but I like it. Yeah, this is nice. This is nice for Jacob. I felt the whole, I've, I've seen some that I wouldn't touch and I've yep. seen, I made a sweater out of one that was really soft. Nice. So yeah. Jacob's lovely. Yeah, they're a cool breed. They're they're a heritage breed um, as well. And known for their horns most of the time. Yeah. They're, they're kind of crazy big horns. They can have up to six horns. That's crazy. <laughs> Sometimes not the most fun thing to shear. No. <laughs> but yeah, that um, so that's a, a kit we put together with roving from all those different breeds because a lot of the people we shear for don't have a market for their wool. Mm-hmm. If they're not knitters or spinners themselves, mm-hmm. even if they raise beautiful fleeces, they don't always have the skills or the time or the ability to really develop the market to sell their wool. Mm-hmm. Um, and the commercial wool industry, the market there is not in a good place. A lot of that wool couldn't be sold. Colored wool or wool that has you know, possible black or red fibers in it cannot be sold very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, when we're out shearing, we look for wool that's still good quality, but just doesn't have a place to go, and we try and find a market for it. So what would happen to this wool, like if, if there wasn't small people like you know you mm-hmm. and, and, and others to bring this forward, mm-hmm. what would happen to this wool? A lot of it just gets composted or thrown away, um, and wool doesn't compost super quickly, so people will just have like a pile at the back of their property of old wool that they just couldn't sell it yeah it's kind of sad but. yeah i've heard people burn it sometimes yeah and it's not super flammable i don't, so I don't imagine it smells well no it's <laughs> a challenge to burn it oh, okay well so that's great so um this sampler box do you still have some available yeah we've got some still on our website okay so um if you're interested uh, i have her link below and so there's probably not a huge amount though no this is like a one-off if we ever do them again it's going to be totally different wool different breeds so. okay so yeah. there might be another box in the future mm-hmm. cool. yeah okay yeah so um is there anything going on and um that you're like working on now that you want to share or things that you might be bringing yeah um with the fiber side of things um We don't do too much ourselves because there's only so much we're shearing and farming. So we sell a lot of it to um, other yarn makers or dyers and they do projects. So if someone's looking for a specific wool and they want to source it domestically, I'll help hook them up with that. So like one of the ones is a Columbia and I had some colored roving, but um, we have a ton of white Columbia and that's being made into a yarn we sell a little bit of it. I'm out of stock now, but um, we sell a little undyed, just white. And then we also get a bunch of it to a dyer in, I believe she's in Ohio. Um, that's Forest Lane Fiber. And she dyes it and sells it and it's been going super well. So that's that's our biggest project I'm really excited about because that Columbia is beautiful, beautiful fiber. Um, and just to put it into perspective, if they went to, the farmers tried to sell that commercially, um, they might get five or ten cents a pound. So, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't really even cover like the gas to go bring it to their wool buyer. It's really unfortunate. But we're able to pay them way more than that, get them a price that they're comfortable with, and then bring it to the hands of knitters everywhere. Mm-hmm. People who will love and appreciate it. That's yeah. really nice. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I know, just that you, so you're not only um, a shearer, but you're a shepherdess. Mm-hmm. So you care and love for these animals. and you know, can you talk maybe a little bit about like the husbandry side of it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, um, like a real passion because it's challenging. I mean, I'm sure as you know, just going through it, um, for a short period, you'll find that raising any livestock can be heart wrenching and it is tough work. Um, but I absolutely love it. I've, I've been in love with animals since I was a little kid and sheep just really stole my heart. They're so, unique I think in their personalities 
Um, I also, I mean, when I was younger, I liked them just because of their size. I mean, there are some big breeds of sheep, but they're still manageable. You know, I can work around them by myself uh, using a little, a little planning. <laughs> um, so like in an annual cycle, um, we lamb mostly in February and March. We have not a huge barn, but it's a space big enough that the ewes can go inside to give birth and we can tend to lambs under a roof without snow everywhere. So mm -hmm. that works for us because <laughs> in our shearing, um, we're out working like seven days a week, April to May. So we would probably lamb later if we weren't shearing, but that works out for us now. And then um, all of our mature sheep, so our ewes that are older than a year, go out to pasture from about May to November. Um, so then that time of year, our huge project is pasture management. We have like a cell grazing system. Most of the pastures we graze are shared with beef cattle, sometimes horses. It's not land that we own, we rent it, but it works really well because the landowner's cattle complement our sheep's grazing. Mm -hmm. So different species um, eat <laughs> differently and get different plants, add different nutrients to the soil. Um, so that's made in November. We're constantly moving them around. We have about 100 acres and we don't necessarily cover all of it. Um, we'll bounce them around wherever the soil needs their manure or the plants need eating down. Sometimes the cows go through and they pick what they want and then we'll follow behind with the sheep to clean up the rest. Um, and then around August, October, November, somewhere down that end of the summer and early fall is breeding season. So rams get introduced with ewes. Because we have fins and borelesters, we have multiple breeding groups because we want to keep everything purebred. So it's breeding season to get us back into lambing again come uh, February, March. Yeah, I bet that's a chore because they don't care. The, the boys, they don't care yeah. who's who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, managing rams I think is one of the most underestimated chores <laughs> for new shepherds because those guys have one thing on their mind and they will go through anything they can to find use. <laughs> I only have one ram and I'm so like right now that's that's all I need. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we have way too many. <laughs> um, but yeah we also do a fall lambing. So with our fins they're such a unique breed. They cycle out of season naturally. Mm -hmm. So most sheep only want to lamb between like February and May, that kind of late winter, early spring. Mm -hmm. The fins will cycle almost year round. Mm -hmm. So we can naturally get them to breed in the spring to lamb in the fall. Mm -hmm. And we do some of that. So we have a smaller <laughs> lambing season in um, October, sometimes we'll do September. Yeah, that, that's probably helpful for you to have the two different, so you're not yeah. having all lambs at one yep. amount. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's an added chore because we have two lambing seasons. We always want eyes on the flock during lambing. We never want to be far from home, but it spreads things out. And especially with our barn, it's not huge, so it, it makes more space for everyone when they need it. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, I love that they just, my sheep just naturally go through one cycle and that's all I yeah. worry about. Yeah, definitely. When I talk to people about the fin breed who are interested in them, I tell them sometimes it's a downside mm -hmm. because if you don't want to be managing rams and ewes separate all the time with distance between them and a lot of fences, um, it can be a challenge to keep them from not breeding whatever they want. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, cool. Well, um, how about, um, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who wants to get into sheep or mm -hmm. 4-H or maybe young or old, um, what kind of words of wisdom would you give? Yeah, I would say um, network locally. I mean, social media and YouTube and Facebook, all of that's great and don't avoid learning there, but also connect with a local network. So most states or regions have like a sheep and wool growers association. Vermont has a sheep and goat association. Connect with those people. Find people in your community that you can talk to. And when you do get into sheep, you can maybe call on a Saturday afternoon when something's going wrong and you need help. Um, along with that, find yourself a veterinarian, a shearer, and if you're gonna do any meat, a butcher before you buy animals. Those things can be hard to find. And especially as a shearer, I get calls all the time in April or May 
when they people want their sheep shorn really soon um, and I'm already booked out to July. So make those connections, find the people you're gonna need to rely on before it's an emergency, especially with veterinarians. You know, you don't wanna be building a relationship with your vet when you're in an emergency. <laughs> um, yeah, and then besides that, I'd just say have an open mind. Like even once you get sheep, even after you have them for a while, there's always more to learn. Uh, Colin and I have been doing this for over a decade each. We have degrees in animal science and I'm learning every day, especially from my shearing clients. People with different experiences, different sheep. Um, it's really, really fascinating to me, but just always keep learning, keep an open mind. Well, yeah, that's a lot of great advice there. I'd say as a new shepherd, because I've only had, you know, just over a year I've mm -hmm. had sheep. And so I would say definitely, I totally agree about the vet. Mm -hmm. Get to know your vet soon. You know, like don't yeah. wait. <laughs> um, especially if you're going to have lambs. That's, yeah, that's if you're gonna, a big one. <laughs> yeah, if you're not, if you don't have lambs, then it's not so prudent yeah. probably. But but lambing is just, can be scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's another one where uh, you might not always need a vet. But if you have a, a local shepherd that you can call upon mm -hmm. and say, do you think I need to call a vet? That's also a good step. I have some shearing clients who call us, even though we're not local, <laughs> and will just say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. What do you think? Yeah. It's nice to have that community. Yeah. Yeah. Especially your first time going through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, time. yeah. And we all go through it. Your first year is um, always going to be stressful, mm -hmm. even if everything goes right first year is the first year <laughs> yeah it's it's like uh, well you know it's not exactly like having a baby but it's it's similar in, yeah. in the in the build up and the anticipation mm -hmm. and is it going to go well and are, you know they're going to be complications mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah very cool all right is there um, any last words that you'd like to, to share with us or um no i think you know like i was saying when you get sheep just keep an open mind keep learning about them uh with the world of wool and fiber and sheep, whether you want to be a shepherdess or you're just into fiber arts, um, there's so much. There's such variety in sheep and the sheep industry. And I think every part of it is super cool, super fascinating. And you can learn something new about it in each sector. And it's all really good for the environment. I mean, sheep are such a good part of the ecosystem mm -hmm. for grazing, for carbon sequestra sequestration. Um, so yeah, however you're connected, uh, I think dive in and learn more. It's it's a really cool community. Yeah, we could have a whole another video on yeah. um, the benefits to what sheep can do for the environment and yeah. for the land. And I feel like that message needs to be spread because there is um, there there are people out there who are giving kind of the opposite message that farming is bad for the environment. And it doesn't have to be. It can mm -hmm. be a very healthy, natural ecosystem. Yeah, and sheep are one of the best. Yeah. One of the best ones to do that. Yeah, very cool. Well, I'm so glad I was able to have you over today and you get to be my first yeah. guest. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to mention this sweater. Mm -hmm. Colin um, sheared this this spring. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so this was nice. our from our ram. And so um, we have Shetland sheep, if you're watching this for the first time and you don't know. Um, and so, so your partner Colin mm -hmm. sheared our ram and just was amazing mm -hmm. handling him. And I just <laughs> was just like, oh my god, he's like like a rag doll. And yeah. This this big to me huge ram, but mm -hmm. he's not really that big. But yeah. but yeah, yeah. That's really awesome. Cool. It looks beautiful. Yeah, I love the different you. colors. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, actually, the black isn't his, but mm -hmm. the but all of the gray are uh -huh. just naturally his. So yeah, I just thought that would be cool to that's wear so with cool. the. Yeah, you here today. I love seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you guys for watching, and uh, maybe in the future we could have you back and talk about. So uh, you've got so much that you could. <laughs> I know there's so much knowledge that you yeah. have that you could share. So this was great. Well, um, see you next time. Thanks. Bye.